Okay, so apparently we made it. Uh, I think I'm going to continue on the track that, that Angelo set uh, last week and earlier this week. And the idea is to give you first, uh, as I understand you have a, so a broad background, first a, an overview of, of the field of research of applications of polymer physics to, to chromosome folding. And, uh, and after giving you a sense of what is this field about and what we uh, do, I'll try to enter, say, in this slightly more technical details to give you a sense of how theoretical physics, statistical mechanics, uh, is used uh, in this context. Of course, please uh, stop me whenever uh, you think I'm, I'm going berserk or I'm not expressing myself. Uh, this is a aim to, to, to be general and, and so do not hesitate to ask any question you, you think I may be, have been skipped. So uh, I want to start from a very, very stupid and, and general title, which is why uh, our genome, our chromosomes, cannot be considered just like random spaghetti in, in, in a bowl. And to try to, to start from scratch, uh, let me go back to the sequencing of the uh, human, uh, human genome. You know that uh, now since almost 20 years, uh, our genome is sequenced in the sense that we know the, 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 the string of, of the bases, the letters, the four letters which compose our, our DNA. Uh, yet, uh, you know, this is considered only the, uh, the end of the beginning in the sense that we know the letters, we know the sequence, but we still do not know how it works. I mean, why a given gene is active in one tissue and must be turned off in another tissue? Why, why a gene which has been silent for years suddenly turns on, maybe an oncogene, and uh, uh, starts cancer. So we can't answer this today. And uh, what we are trying to do is to move in that direction. And trying to answer those questions, how is our genome regulated, uh, of course, is the key to, to access not only the fundamental tissue of life, how life works, but can also from a more practical point of view, open the way to understanding and, and hopefully treating uh, diseases such as cancers. I, I mentioned that, but also congenital diseases. Congenital diseases are diseases which are linked to mutations in, in the patient uh, genome, congenital. So uh, the patient is born with, with the defect. And in all our broader families, there is someone with a congenital disorder. One kid in 20 is born with a congenital disorder. Often, uh, luckily enough, they are just minor things, a little strain thing on your ear, or being taller than, than the average. In other cases, they can be terrible diseases. Think of, of, of uh, body uh, malformation. And in other cases, they can be lethal. And so answering the question I'm going to discuss today, hopefully will give progress also to deal and to uh, make diagnosis and to treat uh, such diseases. And what I want to discuss with you today is some important recent process, progress which has been made in that direction. And in particular, I want to discuss with you a new dimension of DNA, its third dimension, how it folds. But let me go uh, to the very scratch of the story. So uh, again, please stop me if I'm, uh, if I'm repeating things that you know so well. And, and, and Roughly speaking, our DNA is uh, 3 billion bases long. So it's a sequence. It's a string of 3 billion letters. It's a 6 billion because we have two copies roughly for 
uh, of our DNA. And, uh, uh, and when the um, Human Genome Project was accomplished, we know the sequence, and then we know the, uh, the genes. And uh, now we know that humans have roughly 20,000 genes. Genes are a key portion, as you know, of our genome. They are segments along the string, which code for proteins. Proteins are the building blocks of cells. So the system is, is self-contained because you have written somewhere how to build what you need to work. And so protein, uh, the genes are called the coding part of our genome because you know there that is the code to produce those proteins. However, as I told you, we know today that uh, humans have roughly 20,000 coding genes. In that number, the beginning was surprising because uh, it was expected one order of imagine more. Because 20,000, to give you the sense of scale, is uh, not much bigger than the genes, the number of genes that much simpler organisms have, such as Drosophila. Drosophila is the fruit fly. You have seen that. This is the little fly um, flowing around and around fruits in summertime. In Italy, we have seen that for sure. And in, in Drosophila, 16,000 genes. So it's practically as many as we have. What is also surprising is that in the human genome, genes are a very tiny fraction in length. It's less than 2%. The coding fraction of our genome is 1.5%. So the vast majority of our genome is known coding. And up to 15 years ago, maybe even less, that known coding fraction was named junk DNA, as you may know. Biologists thought that it was the relic of evolution. Once we had a tail, and there was a gene for the tail, which is no longer used, and so it's misused somewhere, uh, dispersed in, in, in the 98% non-coding. Well, that view has radically changed in the last 10 years or so. And we know today that in the 98% non-coding of our genome, uh, there is the secret of the regulation of the 2% of the genes. And so this is what I want to discuss now. By the way, from an, an evolutionary point of view, uh, what correlates with the complexity of an organism is not the number of genes. It is the non-coding part of the genome. So if you take very simple organism, bacteria, or even early eukaryotes, early eukaryotes means uh, uh, early organism with, with the nucleus, where DNA is in the nucleus. Uh, genes are, in bacteria, genes are roughly 99% uh, of the genome. So the, the more and more complex is the organism, the bigger is the fraction of the non-coding uh, DNA. So I try to, to tell you what has been discovered, one of the things which have been discovered about how the non-coding portion of our DNA may control the activity of the genes. And, and, and more or less, it's as simple as you see in my picture. It has been discovered that along the sequence of the DNA, there are regions, those in green in my slide, which are non-coding, so you would call them junk in the old terminology, which are essential for the regulation of genes. And they were discovered beginning by chance, uh, as often happens in, in, in real good experiments. They were trying to find genes or something and cut pieces out of the DNA. And they cut pieces in, in the non-coding portion. The expectation was, well, this must be a control. Nothing happens. And instead, they had a brutal effect on the organism. And that was the first indication, one of the indications which led to the discovery of uh, such uh, distal regulatory elements. So along the sequence, uh, you see there are uh, 
comparatively short segments which have the role to regulate genes. It has been discovered originally that if you cut that out, you have an effect of a given gene. And now we know some of the mechanism whereby uh, the control occurs. And one of the key mechanisms which has been discovered is, is, is shown here. What happens is that the regulators can act on the gene by folding, looping onto it, and forming a physical contact. And in this way, the gene is turn it on or turn it off or fine-tuned. And this is occurring not for one gene. This is occurring at the same time for the 20,000 genes in our genome. And you, I think, have understood that the way the system folds is dictating what the cell is going to do. And so, and this formidable origami, whereby genes and regulators, 20,000 genes, and their, their vast number of regulators, it is estimated that there are, on average, four regulators per gene in humans. So in this huge amount of sequences and DNA pieces, the way they fold, they come together, the origami they form, is, is the way in which the cells control, specifically control the different activities of the different genes. I, I find this personally surprising because there are a number of questions which I will try to, to discuss, but any you come with is a good question, I think. But I try to list what I have in my mind. First of all, How can a regulator find its target gene? How it comes that they see each other in the darkness of the nucleus and come together? This is not trivial because this is functional. So you may not risk not to meet. You die if you not meet. Second question How is this coordinated for 20,000 genes and their corresponding regulators? You, think, you see, this is, this is far from trivial. If you, have, if you are in Piazza San Pietro in Rome, the Pope is, is giving his mass. And there is a crowd there, 20,000 people. How do you find your friend if you have not your mobile phone? It's far from trivial. So uh, what I want to build uh, on is on, on, on this question. But first, I would like to give you the sense of what are the discoveries and the quantitative experiments, which are hopefully opening a way uh, to, to answer this. Again, from scratch, uh, you know that in our cells, in humans at least, in eukaryotes, the DNA is not a single filament, but it's a, made of, in human, 23 pairs of filaments, which are named chromosomes, as you know. And those chromosomes uh, are linear filaments, so polymers. Uh, and uh, they are all included in the, in, the, in the nucleus of the cell. So if this is a human cell, in, there is an organelle inside uh, which contains the DNA, the 23 chromosomes. And I want to try to give you a sense of scale. The nucleus is order of magnitude 10 microns in size. The DNA content in each nucleus of each cell is roughly two meters. If you take the 23 chromosome pairs and you attach one to the other, it's two meters. And those two meters are packed in, in a 10 micron linear size object uh, organelle. So there is a, an astonishing problem of packing. And it's not just packing, because the way you pack uh, is going to set what you are going to do. If you leave, if you survive, if you become a muscle, or if you become a bone, or, or the number of tissues that we have in our body. And an important discovery on how chromosomes pack into the nucleus 
uh, was made, say, at the beginning, say, around crossing of this century. And, 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 and the scientists who, who contributed really to that are two brothers, uh, D'Angelo knows well, the Kramer brothers, physicist and, and, and the medical doctor turned biologist. And what they discovered with tools I'm not going to discuss now, because it's exciting, it is a nice story. We can chat about that at lunchtime, how they discovered it. But, but what they found is essentially depicted here. This is a much later uh, experimental uh, observation. This is based on microscopy. And you have understood that what I'm showing you here is a, a, a nucleus of a human cell in the different colors you see that, that, that are different chromosomes. This type of picture is obtained with a technique which is essentially based on, on fish. Fish is a technique whereby you can stain DNA. And in particular, in the case shown, you can stain differently, different chromosomes. And so you see by eye how the different chromosomes locate into the nucleus. And this is a real image, a real image, a microscopy image. And, uh, and uh, I hope I conveyed you the excitement I have about that. Because if you look at this, you immediately realize that the system is far from randomly organized. Suppose you have a spaghetti, colored spaghetti, and you cook them, and then you put them in, in, in a dish. You know what you expect to have, something like that. And instead, what we see are these discoveries. Is that uh, it is as if each chromosome knows that he has an identity, compactifies, in, uh, we called it in Italian, a nido, a nest. You see, that for, that, the, the red chromosome has folded on itself. And the others as well. And they know how to locate one with respect to the other. So it's a highly organized structure. Far from being a random mixture of spaghetti. And so again, the question is, what is the invisible hand which produced this? And uh, how is that controlled? With, the, uh, with microscopy, uh, this is a picture, I think, of 10 years ago. With microscopy, major advancements have been made in recent years, but including the Nobel Prize and so on. But, but yet there is a problem, fundamental problem of resolution, because it's still very difficult to investigate what happens inside a chromosome. And there is where the excitement is, because I told you that distal regulators typically are on the same chromosome. And so if we want to understand how life works, we must be able to, to, to resolve inside a chromosome. By the way, in fact, there are contacts, functional contacts, also across chromosomes. So the activation of one gene depends on what is, what is the contact with another chromosome. But, but in general, it is in cis. This is the way biologists name it. So regulation depends on what is on the same chromosome. But anyway, the key question is to resolve what is happening there. And microscopy has, has a resolution problem there. And so maybe, as Angelo told you already, in recent years, uh, important progress have been made to devise uh, the thing of technologies to allow to circumvent microscopy and to, uh, to try to understand who's contacting whom uh, at very fine scale. And I want to, to introduce the, the topic. I want to briefly mention the technology that we uh, produced with, with, uh, with Anna Pombo uh, in Berlin. And I want to do that because it's very easy to explain. And it's, uh, it's essentially a statistical mechanics idea. And, and, and the idea is the following. Suppose you want to measure who's proximal to whom. So which enhancer, which regulator is in contact which, with which gene. Well, and you cannot use microscopy because you want to go finer. 
the stupid idea we had is, is, is summarized in this slide. Suppose you can cut slices, random slices, through the nucleus of your cell. And suppose that you have two sides of interest, the, I don't know, the red and, and the green. Well, if you cut a tiny slice to the nucleus, it's very unlikely that the red and the green are both in the same slice. Usually, you cut a slice and you don't find any. If one of the two is present in the slice, say the red, it's very unlikely that also the green is present in the same slice if the red and the green are randomly positioned. Instead, if the red and the green are close by, are in physical proximity, then it's very unlikely that in a slice you find the red. But if you find the red, you also find the green. And so by just cutting sections to different nuclei and collecting the statistics, you can resolve who's contacting whom at the level of the single cell and at the resolution which is, in principle, only dictated by your ability to sequence DNA. So, in practice, what we do is the following. We cut slices to a number of nuclei, random slices. How we cut? That's the easiest part. And uh, it's, uh, the, it's something which is well, well established in, in molecular biology. They have ways to, to cut, to cut thin sections. And uh, it's really mechanical. So, with the sides. That's 10 micron, I told you. In the slice that we cut is in, in, in the paper that I, I guess you see, they sit there. The size of the slices we cut is uh, 200 mi uh, nanometers. Uh, but this is not the real technological difficulty. The real technological difficulty, uh, if you want to go that way, is to extract DNA from those slices without burning it. This is where we really had a hard time with. So the, uh, the story goes that this is a, a, a statistical mechanics idea. Simple statistics. Then you have to implement it. And, th and that, that took time. So the, the, the difficult part is to, uh, once you have extracted the slices, what we want to do is to know what is inside the slice. And that's based on sequencing. And you know that sequencing technologies have made huge progresses in recent time. And so you can really sequence tip. You can really know with fine details who's, who's there if you do not burn it. Because the, the way we do it is you can't the slice, then with laser ablation, you extract the section of the nucleus, and you have not to burn the DNA when you extract it. And once you have extracted it, you have it in a tube, and then you just sequence it. And so after sequencing for each section, you know which a bit of DNA was present or absent. So for instance, in that slice, the three loci of interest are all present. In that one, this is missing. In that one, this is the only present, and so on. And you have this for a hundred or so slices, and with some computing, it's not really difficult. There's only, there is some math, but, but nothing extraordinary for, for statistical mechanicians like us, uh, with some computing, you can reconstruct the contact probability. So what you see here is real data. This is a, an example of 5 mega on chromosome 6. And this is a so-called contact map. I think Angelo, Angelo, Angelo mentioned that. A contact map tells you for each pair of sites what their contact probability. So how many times, say, what's the fraction of cells where they are found together in physical proximity? And again, you see that there are patterns. So I don't know if you have 
process of that. But suppose DNA is, uh, at least within a chromosome, is randomly mixed. You expect to have uniform matrices. Maybe there is only a, an effect dependent on, on the genetic distance, so how far they are along the linear sequence of the genome. And so you have, you have to expect something like that, no patterns. Because if you, the system is translational invariance, invariant along the genome, if it is random. And instead, you see there are complex patterns emerging, also at the level of folding of chromosomes within a single chromosome. And those patterns are telling us the story of the contacts between genes and regulators. That's why those data are very exciting, because this is quantitative data. This is not saying, well, I've seen a couple of times chromosome X contacting chromosome Y. No, this is telling you the frequency. This is a quantitative measure of, of contacts. And so for physicists, this is very exciting, because now we can make models from data. We can test our models against data. We can make predictions and test the theories. OK, so uh, first glimpse on what those patterns are. I think by high, you immediately see that there is sort of a hierarchical organization. Because if you stare at the picture, uh, you see that there are sort of blocks of interactions along the diagonal. And those blocks, though, are included in bigger blocks, which are them themselves part of even bigger blocks. So this means that contacts are organized in a hierarchical way. And in the picture, which is emerging, of how chromosomes are folded, is, is uh, a hierarchical organization. So if you could zoom into a chromosomal territory I showed you beginning, then you would see something like that. At least this is what this type of data. Uh, this is, by the way, the first technology introduced to, to map contact, which is the high C technology. And what happens at the uh, nuclear scale, the current picture is uh, brood uh, picture is, is this one. So this is a, a schematic picture to give you the idea of what happens. What high C data, what GAM data, this new technologies I, I told you about, tell us is that each chromosome uh, produce a strong network, network of contacts. However, there are interactions across chromosomes. And with the technologies I told you, it looks like that they are much weaker. So on average, interactions across chromosomes are two orders of magnitude smaller than interactions within a chromosome. But they are significant and biologically functional. And so the picture that overall is emerging about chromosomes are organized in the nucleus uh, is, a, I would say, a net of nets, in the sense that each chromosome has a strong network of contacts, functional contacts, but the different chromosomes interact with each other, forming a global net of nets. So I try to uh, give you a, s a summary of what I, what I discussed. So the impression is that to regulate gene, you have to fold DNA. Because in answers, regulators in general have to come in contact, physical contact with, with the genes. And so at the scale of genes, you have a sort of organization of, of, the, of the genome. But that organization is not limited at the scale of single genes. It extends hierarchically over entire chromosomes. And there is a structure also at the level of the entire nucleus of a cell. So this is a crash course in, in, uh, in uh, chromosome folding, technically speaking, or now chromatin folds. Chromatin uh, is a technical term to say not vague chromosome, but the real chromosome, how they are inside a cell. And so with all the machinery of molecules attached to them. 
uh, if I have time, I will tell you more about that later on. So now where physics enters. And uh, pictorially, uh, to tell you what this community of physicists is doing in this field, let me try to, to, to make an analogy with, with the physics of atoms and nuclei. The big development of quantum mechanics, you know, is, is linked to, to experimental and technological progresses. At some point, spectral lines could be identified. And it could be understood that there are patterns unexpected from classical physics. And, you know, so there is a long story which uh, takes us from Democritus to, to, to modern quantum mechanics. And in a sense, the aim of this type of physics applied to biology is, is the same. We want today to understand not what's the structure of the nuclei of atoms, but what's the structure of nuclei of cells. And so what are the principles which control that? And then what are the principles which control life? and the implications that I told you about. So this is what we uh, try to focus on. And this is what I want to discuss in my lectures later on. But first, I would like to give you an overview, an idea, what are the, the ideas uh, that are being uh, discussed in the literature at the moment. So I want to get back to, to the original starting question I had for you. How can a regulator and a gene find each other? And I want to try to, to give you a sense of scales. A gene in human is order of magnitude a few thousands of bases. And we know today that regulators can be as far as one million bases away from their target gene. So, 1,000 times more distant than the length of the gene itself. And often regulators can be a few hundreds or a thousand <laughs> bases long. And so again, the big question is how do they find each other uh, in the darkness of the nucleus? What are the mechanisms whereby they come into contact? Or in the terminology I use here, it's the glue which brings them, holds them together. And um, a theoretical physicist approach to this is, I would say, even trivial. If you have a, a force which takes two, two objects together, there must be a particle which mediates the interaction. Nothing more than that. We know this from basic physics. Of course, here, the particles which mediate the interactions are not fundamental particles but are stupid molecules of biochemistry. And so the idea is really trivial. You have molecules which can bridge the gene and the regulator. And you can show, I will show that to you later on, they produce an effective field, an attractive force. In fact, there is a thermodynamic transition whereby the two, the stable state of the two objects is to come in close proximity and to be hold in close proximity. And so the idea is that, well, we have just to find the, what's the standard model which describes uh, such interactions. And then life is just a matter of solving an Hamiltonian problem. I don't know if I'm clear enough. And so this is the, the line of thinking. And um, in this way, you can think that you can reconstruct the structure. If you understand what's the Hamiltonian of your system, you can think you can reconstruct the structure of chromosomes and predict the way they fold. And, and uh, you see here an example of how the, the genome around the SOX9 gene looks. Complex structure, nested structures. You remember the hierarchical organization I, I showed you emerging from the data at the beginning. And, and by the way, this is a the reason why I'm showing SOX9 is because this is a, a gene associated to human diseases, to congenital disorders. 
And so understanding how is the regulation of SOX9 occurring? So when and how are its regulators interacting with him? There's also very practical implications. Uh, originally, these were movies on my computer, but this is a PDF I cannot show you the, the movies in, in their uh, full structure. But this slide was to give you a sense of how you can control differentially a given gene in different tissues. Um, in this example, this is a, a region, a stretch of DNA, it's roughly two mega around the alpha globin genes. And I highlight in yellow and red the gene and its regulator. And you see here, uh, the static picture isn't fully expressing the richness of the dynamics of the, of the problem. But what I'm showing you here is, on the left, how the genes and regulators are located in the DNA of mouse embryonic stem cells, where the genes are off. And how they refold, you, I, I guess it's difficult to see in this, um, this nap, time snapshot. But anyway, this is the way it refolds in erythroid cells, when those genes must be activated. And I, I'm forced to explain you more details with David because you don't see the movie. The, what you should notice is that the genes and regulators are far apart uh, in, in this case, and they become much closer, they enter in contact in this other case. And so this is way how specific regulation of activity is occurring, at least for, for the alpha globin genes, at least in those two tissues. And as I said, Oh, yes, yes. Uh, the idea is precisely that. Now that you have the tools, you go and try to make sense of what is happening in, in, in embryonic stem cells. Uh, I try to summarize for those of you who are less familiar. Embryonic stem cells are, are uh, cells which are called pluripotent because they are the cells which can give rise to all the tissues of our body. And, and they are known to be differentially controlled with respect to other tissues. And, and what you ask is, can we make sense of how is this differential regulation occurring at the genomic scale? And this is exactly the direction where we are going. And I will come to that later on. That's why I'm answering very, very shortly about that. Because instead, to try to come up and wrap up my, my introductory uh, part of the lecture, the lecture uh, I want to mention the application of, of this type of concept. And I want to discuss, for instance, the case of genetic diseases, which I, which I mentioned at the beginning. An example of a genetic disease is a, a disease induced by, by a mutation in genome, a deletion in the example shown. So there is a kid which is born without the cyan pieces for some reason. And one of the key problems in genetics today is to predict the effect of that to make a diagnosis. Is the kid surviving or not? What are, what's the impact of that? Is this a minor impact or is it lethal? And today, the only way that genesis is used, or virtually the only way genesis is used to try to make a prediction is to see if the deletion or the mutation in general is affecting a specific gene. If you miss a gene, well, we have a chance to say, yes, this is risky. But I told you that genes are less than 2% of our genome. So the vast majority of inherited mutations nowadays cannot be diagnosed. And I, I think you understand what's the impact of that. We all have family stories about that. So you can imagine. What's the leap forward of starting from first principles to try to make a prediction and say, no, look, that mutation is not involving a gene, but it is lethal because this is changing the way in which that gene is interacting with its regulators. 
Because, for instance, a trivial effect is that you pick out a piece, and then a regulator which should act on another gene starts interacting with the wrong gene and activates the wrong gene and induces a phenotype. This is the name in, in, in biology and genetics. And I will show you examples of that and how we can predict this. And let me just have a quick tour to give you the sense of what we can do today. This is a real example. Is it? This is a real human patient. And this is another re genomic region uh, which is linked to human diseases, in particular limb malformation. This is the region around the FA4 gene. And uh, this is the contact map of that region. This is roughly two, three megabase long region. But anyway, without details, I will tell you that more, uh, more about that later on. Uh, this is the content map in the so-called wild type case, so the healthy, normal case. And you see here the interaction of FA4, PAX3 is another re gene in the region, WIN6, with the, uh, this little thing here is an enhancer of FA4, is, an, is a regulator of FA4. And you see here what's there, the structure of the interactions in the locus. Uh, locus is a name biologists used to say uh, a region. So when I will say locus, I mean a region around the given gene. So this is the healthy case. And this is the, what happens when you have a deletion here. This is a, a deletion only on, on, on one of the two alleles. And so what you see here is the combined map. And that deletion produces brachydactyly, so a malformation of, of, of limbs, of the hand. And what this is showing is that when you have that deletion, what happens is that the enhancer of FA4, you see, starts interacting with PAX3. And what was shown by our collaborators is that PAX3 is upregulated is sets on, starts producing as proteins, and that's leading to the malformation. And what, even, what I think is even more exciting is that uh, I deceived you because the top uh, data is motor predictions, theoretical physics-based predictions. The real experiments, which are only controlled, are beneath. And you see, there is a good agreement between polymer physics and experiments with the patient cells. And so, I guess, without now entering too many details, you see what's the, the future that, that we envisage today by using this type of methods, theoretical physics methods, in biology, in genetics is that we can really change the world of diagnosis and treatments of diseases. I see in the short-term future the possibility of revolutionizing diagnosis. And if not for my generation, I'm confident that for your generation, having we understood the principles of control of genes. Also treatment will be available for a number of diseases, such as those I mentioned, which nowadays are not treatable. And so let me wrap up, and then we stop for, I don't know, half an hour, what's, what's the standard? My wrap up is the following. Hopefully what I just started introducing you to is it's the fact that the genome has an important physical dimension. It's the way it falls in space is crucial for the regulation of genes. And by combining progresses, technological progresses in, in biology, molecular biology, and in the principles of theoretical physics, we start, we start, only start understanding uh, what are the principles whereby life itself works. That is to say, how our genome is controlled. And this may open, I think it can open, a real revolution 
in genetics and medicine in the way I briefly summarized for you. And I'm stressing that on one hand for uh, the excitement that we have as basic scientists in this, but also to give you the sense of opportunity that in this emerging field is for people like you, I should say, like us, but I am a bit old. I mean, this is a, a field where there are wonderful opportunities for us basic scientists because of the world of discoveries that is ahead of us, where there are huge business and then job opportunities in very high profile companies. There's an entire section of Alphabet which is working on this. Uh, just to give you the sense of what are the, uh, the opportunities uh, in the job market for this type of topics. And so, unless you have questions, which I'm very happy to, to answer, I will stop here and uh, meet you in uh, uh, half an hour. And then and we start with a slightly more technical uh, lecture. So, so thank you and uh, open to question only if you have them.